Hey folks, welcome back to another Data Science 1 lecture. Uh, today we're going to be talking about regularization. Um, so we've uh, we've talked about model building uh, quite a bit in the past. We've introduced uh, some of the, the main branches of supervised learning, regression, and classification. Um, and, and we've introduced a, a general philosophy behind model building, which is that, uh, you know, models are these, uh, you know, imperfect, uh, imperfect representations of the world, um, uh, noted by this uh, uh, quite soothing picture of, of George Box. Um, and then we, we follow that up by saying, uh, uh, kind of misusing Einstein's quote that, uh, that models um, should be uh, made as simple as possible, but, but no simpler. And we've said this is a, a really important approach to figuring out um, how, you, uh, how you take a, a process that's way too complex to be represented computationally and try and, and distill it. Um, but we, we haven't gotten into any detail about how you would actually go about that. We've, we've just used it so far to motivate the idea that if you start with uh, linear models, which are uh, kind of by definition simpler than nonlinear models, um, that, that that's a good place to start. Uh, but, uh, but really we want to be doing even more fine grain uh, tuning of, of just how complex our model is, uh, and especially uh, subtly changing that depending on, on what data set we have. Um, and so, so that's the, the, the role of regularization. Um, and, and we're going to go just really briefly over a high level example of that and, and give you a flavor of a couple versions of regularization that we use in linear regression. Um, and, uh, and, and hopefully this, uh, this lays the, the groundwork and the idea of this concept, which we can uh, then also apply to some of the, the more advanced models that we'll introduce over the, the next few lectures as well. So the, the main concept and, and idea here of model complexity is something that we've, we've also talked about before, uh, which is, is overfitting. Uh, and, uh, and, and as we mentioned uh, in the, the previous lecture, with a model that's not complex enough, uh, you're not going to be able to capture the interesting trends in your data, as is shown on the left. Uh, with a model that's, that's too complex, you end up uh, fitting the noise rather than the, the patterns. And while you're training data, uh, you're training uh, metrics do very well. Um, when you get to test or validation time, they do really poorly. Um, and so we, we try and find a, a middle ground, but we, we left that by just saying that uh, that uh, some you know Goldilocks effect in the middle was great, but no, but not necessarily how to achieve that. Um, so we we uh, alluded to the idea of cross validation being important for that, um, but but left it as a, a really manual uh, ad hoc process to to figure that out, and and we're gonna try and automate that a little bit uh, in in today's lecture. So. Just to be a, a little bit even more explicit about uh, about that idea of overfitting, um, that, uh, that on the the left here we have uh, a handful of different models of, of varying complexity to fit this data, um, and and as you can see from uh, the, the the blue line, which is the most complex version of the model, um, we have these these wild swings um, that are are drastically overfitting the, the data. You can see it's, it's perfectly going through the, the blue points, which are the data, but as we introduce more test data or validation data or, or try and generalize the model uh, uh, more in general, um, with the, the, the red test points, um, you can see that our, our accuracy and our error fall quite a bit. So just giving a, an explicit example for what we talked about in the last slide, if we we're then to go and plot uh, the the metrics for our train and our test. Um, you would see that while the uh, the training loss goes down, which means that that it's uh, better fitting the training data. Um, if we were to show the accuracy plot, it would mean the accuracy is going up, um, but the the error is is going down for our training in blue. Um, but in red, our, our test error and our test loss is, is getting much, much worse as, we, uh, as we're fitting not kind of nonsensical patterns uh, to, to capture the, the noise in our, um, 
in our training data. So for example, I, I don't know uh, or don't, don't recall what this process actually is, um, but you can imagine that uh, you know there's probably not these huge swings up to you know 50 or 100 uh, perhaps um, you know between negative one and one. Um, like uh, like this model uh, shows to try and capture the um, the the noise that's uh, in uh, j just happens to be captured by the, those two data points uh, around let's say point eight and one um, that uh, that have a, a, a really strong uh, really uh, high slope between them. So uh, to 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 beat a dead horse here. Um, if we're thinking about model complexity in response to um, to the the uh, the prospect of overfitting um, with a, a linear regression model, we're going to fit a, a straight line, and so through some number of data points, um, we're going to capture some aspects of it, but but not others. Um, uh, as we uh, get uh, more and more overfitting, like we saw in the, the last slide. Um, we're going to to fit our uh, our training data better here, um, and we're also going to increase our our model complexity. So you can see from the parameterization at the top here um, that uh, that that as we introduce more terms, um, our our model is is doing better and better at at fitting the data, um, and we can kind of continue this uh, for for as long as we want. Um, until we have, uh, in, in this case, with our, our eight data points, uh, it turns out that a, uh, a degree eight uh, linear polynomial model uh, perfectly fits the data. And, and that's a, a trend that you'll see generally is that uh, you know, with uh, an equal number of, uh, of rows and columns, or to say of, of data points and features, you can perfectly fit uh, any any training set. Uh, that's something you you may remember from uh, from uh, linear algebra, um, trying to do matrix solves on uh, on, on square matrices. Um, so so we we have uh, this this increase in complexity, uh, you know, clearly leading to overfitting. Um, but but the, another reason that I, I stepped you through this um, this process is to also capture kind of the way that we go about traditionally thinking about fitting models, um, which is the the way you're taught in basic statistics is to start with a, a linear model that's that's really simple and try and fit that. And if that doesn't work, then you switch to a quadratic function. You try and fit that. Um, Use you know some matrix solve or, or machine learning um, to to fit the best quadratic you can. If it doesn't fit well, then you go up to you know a third order, a fourth order, a fifth order polynomial and, and try and fit those iteratively. And that's a a, a really uh, simple and, and nice idea um, to, that uh, it, it has a strong bias towards. Uh, leading you to these simple models because that's that's the place you you search first, um, and and in many cases this approach ends up uh, ends up being uh, uh, pretty reasonable computationally as well. It's uh, it's a little bit less the case in in model fitting here um, because we're still running through all the data. But if if you think about the analogy to this in something like uh, in something like search. Um, the, the computer scientists in the room may recall that uh, that iterative deepening search, where you you know look uh, search on on trees of of depth one and then depth two and then depth three iteratively like this, has the same computational complexity as um, as just looking at the the final order um, polynomial. Um, for the, the non-computer scientists in the class, uh, forget uh, forget what I just said, um, but uh, the 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 idea here is that um, while while it's a, a a nice approach to think about uh, kind of manually tuning um, the complexity of your model, uh, or in this class kind of taking the approach of um, of automating uh, and, and and optimizing whatever we can. Um, so let's let's think about how that that applies to model selection here too. 
So uh, in general, both in uh, how we fit the model, um, uh, our, our actual process, uh, as well as uh, uh, what our model is doing to the data, which is, is fitting way too much. Um, we're, we're, we're kind of going way over the top here. So how can we, uh, how can we simplify both of these processes? The, the maybe most intuitive version of this is, is something we've talked about a little bit about in our EDA and, and pre-processing uh, lectures, which is feature selection. So if you have uh, you know, many rows and you know, either not enough data points or too complex a model, uh, one thing we can think about is just picking the features that we think are most important and training a smaller model on those. Um, that uh, you know, in, instead of uh, you know fitting a uh, you know ten thousand dimensional uh, vector on a complete bag of words for your uh, NLP model, you might uh, just look at the you know ten most frequent words in the text or hundred most frequent words in the text, and try and use those as the features to to fit your model. Um, so in in some cases, uh, that's it's really clear, or uh, maybe you're working with a, a domain expert who has a lot of intuition about what the important features are for a model. Uh, but, but in general, that's not a, a really scalable process to just try and think really hard um, about, uh, about which features you should use. Um, and so, uh, so kind of the, the meta question here is, is can we ask uh, machine learning to, to do this? Um, so remember uh, from a, a few lectures ago when we introduced um, the the idea of loss functions in in uh, in regression um, that we we talked about the, the the squared loss, which is just to say that our our error um, the the mean squared error the absolute um, error um, is uh, is is what we're going to 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 use to think about um, measuring and also optimizing. Uh, how well our data fits, or sorry, how, how well our model fits our data. Um, and uh, I mentioned that, that we'll use uh, the L2 uh, term to think about the, the squared loss and the L1 to think about the, the first order absolute loss. And I, I alluded to the idea that we, we come back to this, uh, th this idea um, soon and, and that time is now so we are uh, are, are both going to reuse the the uh, l2 and, and l1 naming um, but especially we're going to reuse the idea of looking at um, uh, 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 different losses um, for not just our model errors um, but also for our model complexity um, so so what does that mean um, what does that mean practically? Uh, we have our, our original uh, loss function. That, that's how we optimize our model, which was to say we're, we're going to minimize the, the square of the errors um, in, uh, in, in any L2 loss where we're looking at, uh, at um, the, the mean squared error. Um, but we can also introduce some other auxiliary terms uh, and and uh, append those to our loss function. And, and what that asks our model to do is consider not only uh, how well our model is fitting, but also uh, these, these other features. Um, and the, the, the other feature that we're going to incentivize our, our model to be fitting uh, is, uh, the, in, in this case, the, the L0 norm, um, which is to say, how many non-zero uh, terms do you have in your model? So with a you know a, a seventh order model like we just said, or it doesn't even have to be you know increasing order. It could just be uh, you know a, a set of features that you have, maybe different words or um, or different uh, different attributes um, that uh, that are our L zero loss uh, is is just to to count up how many of those there are. Um, and, and add that as uh, kind of an, an increased uh, pseudo error uh, on our loss function. Um, and so the, the effect of that um, is to, uh, is to, uh, to uh, as you would expect, uh, use fewer and fewer terms um, in, in your model. So for the, the picture on the right here, 
Um, imagine the the circles being the uh, the, the uh, loss or error landscape um, that we're trying to to get to the the center, the the darkest points here on this topological map. Um, and, and what we have for the, the axes is uh, how that loss changes as we look at larger values of, uh, let's say, just uh, our, our parameter one or our parameter two. Um, and, and as you can see here, um, we, we have a, a strong incentive to only use one of those parameters with our L0 loss. Um, and so the, the question is, you know, how can you increase or decrease um, your uh, the, the value of you know just a, a single one of these. So uh, for example, if we, we were to, to consider um, uh, a, a certain loss term uh, or, or a certain magnitude of a loss term. So let, let, let's say uh, we, we want to think about uh, you know, a, a, a unit loss for our, our regularization penalty here, um, which is just say, uh, you know what's uh, what's the best model we can find with using you know less than one uh, L zero penalty, and the the two options for that are we can have our one feature be theta one, or we could have our one feature be theta two. Um, and so uh, if you you look at this picture here, uh, it turns out that that having uh, you know uh, a use of theta two gives you much better performance, gets you closer to the the center or the the peak of our loss function. Um, compared to just using theta one, and so if if we were to plug uh, this into our machine learning system and, and ask it to do a model fit, it would fit the, a model that uses only parameter number two. Um, and so by doing that, we've effectively reduced our model complexity um, from a, a model with two terms down to a model with one term, um, and we didn't have to specify ahead of time which one that was. Uh, we we used machine learning and the the uh, optimization process that we were already doing to fit the values of these parameters to also uh, figure out which ones are are important or not. So uh, just to to reiterate here, the the L zero loss is the number of of non zero features in our model. Now now uh, as I'm guessing, uh, you you've. Uh, uh, you, you figured out where we're going next is uh, is to look at at other versions of this. So uh, the the L zero loss uh, makes a lot of sense intuitively, but we actually almost never use it in practice. Um, and and why is that? Uh, it's uh, it's because the the idea of having these harsh step functions um, where you have a loss that's uh, that's discreetly turned on or off when something is present or not. Uh, it isn't very well behaved computationally, and so it's it's pretty hard to optimize uh, with the the standard procedure that we use for fitting models. So instead, uh, we can uh, 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 think of other norms that uh, that approximate this well. Uh, so our our L one norm uh, is is similar to this. Um, in that uh, we we penalize for the magnitude of of each term um, in particular, um, and so so what that means is that uh, that uh, you will add up the magnitudes of each of the terms in your your function, um, and and as you can can uh, hopefully uh, glean from the the picture on the right here. Um, that could be, you know, like the solution that we had before of only using parameter number two and none of parameter number one. It could be the, the converse of using, you know, just parameter number one and none of parameter number two. But we can also have intermediate values of, let's say, we, uh, we use half the amount of parameter one that we really want to and half the amount of parameter two. Um, that if, if each of those have, uh, have, um, uh, magnitudes of 0 0.5, then that still fits inside our, our pretend unit circle here. And so this means that uh, we're able to have uh, intermediate values uh, of, of both of these features, but as may not be totally obvious from the, the picture, um, uh, but, but maybe you can, you can uh, see how this uh, overlaps on our, our pretend lam loss landscape here. Uh, the the closest you can get to the the center of the landscape, the the best uh, error you can get within this you know unit circle, which is actually a, a unit rhombus here, is to be maximizing uh, theta two.
um, and to, to say that we're, we're again only going to be using that parameter um, just like we were for the L0 loss. Um, so it, it, it just happens to turn out that uh, the, the way the math works, uh, this L1 norm, while being a lot more computationally feasible, um, if we plug it in and it set our loss to be, uh, to be proportional to the sum of the magnitude of the coefficients, uh, we end up with sparse features. So we, we only use um, the, the features that are, are really important. And by really important here, we mean that the, the increase in penalty um, that we, we occur from using them uh, at, uh, is outweighed by how much our model gets better when, when we use them. So we're, uh, we're, we're essentially putting a, a cost on, on using more and more complex models, which isn't to say that we can't use them, but just that we only use them when the price makes sense. Uh, we can uh, think about extrapolating this idea even further to, uh, sorry, I should say before we move on, that there's a, a specific name for uh, linear regression that uses the L1 norm, and we call that lasso regression. Um, so you'll, you'll hear that term a lot in, in machine learning and data science, and, and lasso just means linear regression with an L1 cost penalty. Um, we can extrapolate this further to uh, an L2 cost penalty, um, and, and this process is called ridge regression. And so here, instead of uh, penalizing the uh, the magnitudes of the uh, of the features or, or the coefficients of the features, um, what we're penalizing is the uh, the the square of those magnitudes, which is to say. Um, that uh, assuming we have uh, weights that, that tend to be uh, less than one in, in magnitude when we square them, um, we end up with, uh, with uh, you know, nonlinear smaller values. And, and so uh, when you, you plot the sum of those, uh, what you get here is a, a circle for our, our uh, parameter, uh, um, parameter allowance ball within this, this uh, one unit of uh, of extra regularization loss. Um, and, and what that means uh, in practice as we try and apply machine learning to them is that uh, the, the, the shape of this, uh, this picture here, uh, you can tell is, isn't uh, quite so sharp at the, the corners um, that, that align with the axes of just using theta two or just using theta one. Um, but actually uh, has, uh, has uh, uh, sticks farther out in the direction of our re uh, reducing loss um, for uh, combinations of some amount of theta one and some amount of theta two. Um, and so uh, the, the L2 norm does a, a better job of uh, uh, allowing you to use uh, multiple features and, and many features, um, yet still keeps the, the magnitude of those small, which is to say, um, that, that the more features you're using, the less you have to, to, uh, to use each one um, in, in particular. Um, and so this, uh, this keeps, uh, again, your, your model small um, and, and incentivizes many of the weights to be low and, and the weights of specific features uh, only to be high if that feature is really important for uh, predicting the outcome of the model. Uh, but it doesn't go quite so uh, harsh in in letting you uh, choose only the features you want, which is to say uh, pushing the coefficients of the features that you don't want down to zero. So you'll with L2 ridge regression, uh, you'll still end up with uh, lots of very small feature, lots of features that aren't used very much that have small magnitudes and some that, that are important and, and are used. So it's a good way of uh, effectively creating these smaller models, um, but it doesn't it doesn't literally use use fewer features and, and turn off the others. Um, th this is is nice in in many cases, especially when you expect the contribution of uh, of your model to uh, to or the the prediction of your model to be having contributions from many many features, uh, lasso regression will do pretty poorly in that because it'll try and pick out just the few features that are really important. Where L two does a little bit of a better job um, of of weighing uh, the the use of features that are uh, are, are uh, the use of many features at once uh, more so than lasso does. Um, so uh, again, this is a, another option for regularization um, that, that that may be be helpful here. Um, 
just uh, one last example is that uh, these norms and these penalties don't need to be um, to be uh, you know one or the other. Um, they're uh, they're not mutually exclusive, and you can think about adding you know as many of these auxiliary loss terms to your function uh, or to to your loss function, and and thus uh, have them impacting your model as you want. So uh, an example is a, a, a linear regression model called elastic net, which uses both the L1 and the L2 norm. Um, and so you have a, a slightly stronger penalty for uh, setting weights to zero, but not quite so, so harsh as, as lasso regression. Um, and so it, uh, it, it's a, a nice compromise between the two of uh, trying to uh, still use few features whenever you can, uh, but with a, a little bit more flexibility to add in, uh, you know, small magnitude other features um, at, at non-zero, uh, but, but small values. Um, and so, uh, so as, as you can see, there, there are a, a little bit of uh, of, of questions uh, that depend on the, the type of model you're expecting um, with, uh, with, with, with this approach. Um, but it, it certainly uh, narrows down the number of implementation and, and design decisions that you need to make um, by, uh, by asking you just to pick a, a loss function and not actually pick a specific model. That uh, again, the, the optimization process and the machine learning under the hood uh, will end up taking that loss function and saying, you know, what's the, the model in, in which terms, uh, uh, the, which, the, what usage of which terms uh, most efficiently uh, 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 gives you good performance on, on this model. Um, and so, uh, so, so this this idea is is a, a really powerful one, and um, and and all, all three of these models are, are really popular. Um, personally, for for a lot of the things I do, um, the the data sets are, are are pretty large. We have lots of features, and we want just a few. So, um, lasso regression uh, works really well um, in in, uh, in in my experience, but uh, there, there are certainly types of problems where ridge and regression or elastic net um, are, are absolutely the, the way to go to. Uh, so just uh, just really quickly to say uh, the the parameterization here, we've talked about using machine learning to optimize this, but, but how exactly does that work? Um, like the rest of this class, we're not going to go uh, under the hood too much for the, the details of, of the actual uh, optimization. Uh, but let me just say, say really quickly, uh, that, that this relates to uh, the idea of, of cross-validation and, and uh, looking at error on held out data, like we've mentioned before. Um, and so it, as you can imagine, uh, having these penalties uh, leads to uh, increasing uh, inability to fit your data. Um, so we, we've seen this uh, you know, on our example of, of underfitting uh, data with, with two simple models. Um, and uh, and and uh, as you increase the penalty that you put on your uh, your your loss function, um, and I, I think I forgot to to point it out explicitly, but there's a there's a, a waiting term here on on our losses that tells you how much you should trade off uh, the the added cost of this penalty versus the the uh, the uh, benefit it has to loss. Um, which is to say, kind of what's what's the cost or the price that that you're assigning to this, um, and uh, and uh, as you look at, at more and more costly penalties, you get simpler and simpler models that that fit your training data less and less well. Um, so so that's a, a negative uh, in, in terms of you know fitting the model, um, but also recall that we didn't want to overfit our model to our training data. We also wanted to consider the the loss landscape. Um, so if you uh, if you're to to plot the the validation error on some held out data, um, you know as you go from underfitting to to better and better fitting the model, your validation error drops, um, and and the the same thing is true as you look at more and more complex models. That uh, a really simple model will will underfit both your training and validation, um, but uh, as as you get more and more complex. In your model, your uh, your validation error will uh, will, will will drop down, um, 
even as your, your training error gets worse because uh, we're, we're overfitting less to our training data the more regularization we're, we're putting in. Um, and so there's, there's, there's some sweet spot where the actual optimal value of our, our uh, cost penalty of our uh, regularization term, um, assuming that the validation error uh, mirrors the, the test error because these are both random, uh, random held out data sets, um, that, uh, that, that, that there's you know, some intermediate value of this, uh, this uh, loss parameter um, that can uh, give you your, your best generalization performance, even at the cost of training error. And so how do we find that? Um, the, the, the simple answer is we use cross-validation. Um, and so, uh, so we uh, you know, don't just look at the training error. Uh, we don't look at the, the test error, because of course that's, that's cheating with, with data leakage. Uh, but we can use the validation error um, to, to find the optimal value of our parameter, uh, of the, the cost of our regularization. Um, and, and you can do this manually through cross validation. Uh, there are also uh, in scikit-learn automated uh, functions that will uh, let you pass in a, a set of um, loss weighting values um, that you uh, that, that you want to consider, um, and and it'll do the cross validation for you and pick the 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 best um, the best uh, value of um, uh, of this term to, to get you the, the optimal validation um, uh, the optimal validation error and hopefully the, the model of the, the correct complexity. Um, one, uh, one last little uh, tidbit that uh, again relies on something we've touched on before is that the uh, the, the features here um, and, and as we're thinking about their, their magnitude or their squared magnitude, um, the, the, the raw values of these features actually really matter. So looking at, uh, at comparing a, uh, uh, a feature that has um, a, a really huge range in scale versus one that, that has much smaller magnitudes, if we're trying to penalize the, the magnitude of the parameters, that will be uh, inversely related to the magnitude of the, the feature values. And so to, to make it fair to be penalizing each of these terms in a way that makes sense, uh, we're, we're going to use uh, something we uh, talked about at the, the very beginning of this class um, related to, uh, to, to standard deviations and, and samples, which is that we're going to, to be standardizing. Um, so uh, that, that's to say that we, uh, one of our pre-processing steps that, that we uh, mentioned that we take is to standardize our data into, into z-scores that have uh, typically zero mean and, and unit variance. Um, and that's, uh, that's great for a, a whole bunch of reasons for fitting models, but especially good if we're thinking about um, equally weighting regularization terms, then, then the standardization becomes really important. Um, I, I think your, your textbook may have talked about normalization too, which is just to squash the values between negative uh, one and one, um, or, or sometimes zero and one. Um, and that, that idea works, uh, work, works also, but uh, the, uh, the, the standardization uh, z-score version, um, and there's, there's also other standardization types that, uh, that, that probably we won't talk about in this class, like, um, like, like uh, using PCA to do this. Um, but uh, we the, uh, the the standardization tends to tends to work a lot better, um, and then uh, a, a final caveat to tag onto this is that uh, we typically apply this only to our um, to our our uh, coefficients of our variables and, and not our intercept um, because as you can imagine it doesn't really make sense to think about uh, a, a small intercept being low model complexity um, or or having to be standard. Uh, standardized, um, the, the intercept should be in, uh, you know, relative to whatever units your output variable is, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be between zero and one. Uh, so, so just to sum up here, um, we've, we've talked about uh, regularization and, and model complexity in general, um, that, that the, the, the complexity is something that affects the, the training performance, but especially the generalization performance of, of your model, and how regularization is uh, a way that we can use machine learning to optimally find out how many and which features we want to be considering in our model. 
uh, which turns out to be a lot easier and typically a lot more effective than trying to do feature selection totally by hand. Um, and, and we do this through cross-validation. Um, so we're, uh, we're picking features that are, are good for our generalization accuracy very explicitly. Um, you mentioned that there are a handful of different types of regularization, uh, lasso, ridge regression, uh, elastic net, uh, L0 regularization um, for, for raw feature selection. Um, and, and each of these have their, their pros and cons, um, but, but they're all kind of following the same general idea. And, and that this general idea uh, can also apply to things outside of, of just, uh, uh, just uh, uh, regression and, and will, is you know, very commonly used in, in even really complex models like deep neural networks. Um, and we, uh, we uh, probably won't touch too much about the effects of this on, on our other models. Um, just uh, just because of the the time limitations in this class, but uh, but know that uh, you know the reason this is a standalone lecture is that this idea um, is a, a really powerful and, and general one. Um, so so that's that's it for today. Um, we will uh, talk about uh, getting into uh, more uh, unique types of, of complex models uh, in the the next couple lectures, and uh, uh, and I'll I'll see you then. Um, Thanks everyone and, uh, and see you online.